Let's explain crypto in under three minutes. Cryptocurrency is a digital form of money or currency that can be sent, exchanged, and transferred without going through a bank or central system through a network known as a blockchain. This means that crypto is decentralized, meaning that it doesn't have a central controlling entity that governs it. But what are blockchains? Essentially, they're a list or a database. Transactions of cryptocurrencies are stored on this list. These transactions are stored in chronological groups known as blocks, hence the name blockchain. Blockchains are also decentralized, meaning that they are managed by a plethora of computers across the world and the code is all open source, meaning publicly accessible. But how does this make it secure? Well, since so many computers have access to the same information, it can be quickly and easily verified that the information is accurate by checking with the other copies in simple terms. Blockchains can also only be added to, so there's no going back and deleting transactions from the past, giving everyone a secure ledger of all transactions of a given cryptocurrency or set of cryptocurrency. But why is it called cryptocurrency? Well, the blocks stored on the blockchain are all secured by cryptography, hence the crypto in the name. This is essentially complicated computer speak for math puzzles. Transactions are signed and verified by miners, solving complex math problems to verify the blockchain, the ledger of transactions. But what are miners? Miners are essentially just computers solving problems. Computers contribute to the blockchain by doing this work and in return get a reward. Miners typically focus on a specific cryptocurrency, say Bitcoin, doing work for the Bitcoin blockchain. These computers, and by proxy the people that run them, get paid in Bitcoin rewards when they solve problems. It's this system that keeps cryptocurrency working. Cryptocurrencies get their price from their utility, scarcity, or interest. In the case of Bitcoin, the largest and oldest crypto, the max number of Bitcoins that can ever be made is 21 million. Not only this, but as new Bitcoins get mined, the blocks on the blockchains, mined by miners, and rewarded in new Bitcoin, the amount of Bitcoin rewarded for each block decreases over time. So unlike the US dollar, which has an infinite supply, theoretically, as more and more people transact in Bitcoin, the value goes up and up because there's a finite limited supply. On the other hand, cryptos can get value from their utility or market interest. Dogecoin is a great example of this. We saw massive gains in Dogecoin, originally created as a meme, purely because there was a lot of market interest. When the interest outpaces the growth of supply, we see the price go up supply and demand. Crypto is just digital money where transactions are stored on digital lists, protected by cryptography and stored on a network of computers, the blockchain. Would you drink toilet water? Well, chances are you probably have at some point in your life. Let me explain. After you flush that magical little handle on your porcelain throne, all wastewater in a city goes to a wastewater treatment plant flowing through sewer pipes. As it reaches the plant, the waste's first stop is something called bar screens. Bar screens are basically large vertical bars that filter out the larger parts of waste. This is also known as the pretreatment process. Whatever the bar screens catch is sent off to a landfill and the remaining wastewater continues on through the plant. Then the water flows to a grit chamber. Sewage flows into the grit chamber and the larger bits like sand, dirt, and corn are allowed to settle out. The heavy parts settle out at the bottom and the now cleaner wastewater flows over weir walls at the top of the basin to go to the next step, primary clarifiers or primary treatment. Primary clarifiers are basically giant settling basins that filter particles larger than 10 micrometers out of the sewage. These particles are called suspended solids and they settle to the bottom of the tank. A giant arm also skims across the top of the water to remove fat and grease. Clarifiers work on the principle of settling velocity, which means that the flow into the clarifiers is slower than the speed at which the particles settle to the bottom. This allows a constant flow while still removing larger solids. After primary clarifiers, the water should contain only organic matter and the clarified water flows over another weir to aeration basins. Aeration basins are the beginning of secondary treatment and are basically giant bubble pits for the sewage. Bubbles flow through the tank pumping oxygen into the water along with return activated sludge or 
happy little microbes who love oxygen and eating waste. The bacteria is now amped up on their favorite drug, oxygen-saturated poop, and they break down any remaining organic matter in the sewage. Next comes secondary clarifiers, where the remaining solids are removed along with the bacteria that were just added to the water in the aeration basins. After this further settling, the water has to be disinfected, which is accomplished in one of three ways in the US typically. Chlorine, ozone, or ultraviolet radiation. This step is to kill all of the microbes in the water. Chlorine kills the organisms and is then removed, ozone causes the microbes' cell walls to break and kills them that way, and UV scrambles the bacteria's DNA so they can't reproduce. After this step, the water or effluent is ready for release back into streams or rivers, and it's basically back to clean water at this point, but any remaining grossness gets diluted out in the larger water basin. Dilution is the solution to pollution, in wastewater treatment at least. But some cities have a shortage of water, so they use a process called full cycle reuse. This is when wastewater effluent is pumped directly into a water treatment plant for further treatment back into drinkable water. In these cases, water treatment is a closed system and water goes in a giant circle from your toilet back to your tap. Though this is a very rare and specialized process, it's also fully safe. The water is molecularly the same as fresh water after treatment. So that's how your waste gets turned back into clean water. To understand the stock market, first we need to understand just what a stock is. A stock, otherwise known as a share, is a financial token or instrument that signifies ownership of a company in some proportion. Basically, if Amazon had 1,000 shares and you bought one share, you would own one one-thousandth of Amazon. In reality, Amazon and companies alike have millions of shares, but that sums up the point. When you own a stock, that means that you own a portion of that company and as the value of that company increases, so too does your stock price. There are also common and preferred stocks, which refer to voting rights of a shareholder. Common stocks have voting rights and preferred shares don't. When you have voting rights, you can vote on things like board elections, mergers, and other financial decisions. Preferred shares are called that because they get preference when a company pays a dividend, which is basically a split of the profit a company makes with the shareholder and they also get preference in other financial situations. The next thing you might be wondering is why exactly companies will sell stocks. The answer to that is pretty simple to get money. Stocks allow a company to raise massive amounts of operating capital with essentially no extra effort or product. The modern stock market often bases the value of a company on its potential earnings down the line, and this means that relatively small companies can earn millions or even billions if investors think that they can succeed in the future. If a company wants to sell their shares, they need a place to do it enter the stock market. Companies often list through one process called an initial public offering or IPO on an exchange. Exchanges are basically the platform that make up the stock market that actually handling the trading of stocks. IPOs and direct listings essentially change the status of a company from a privately held business to a publicly traded one. IPOs can let company founders cash out their stake or just let the company raise money. Once a company's stocks are listed on a stock exchange, the public can trade them. Usually prices will fluctuate based off of public opinion, but the more concrete trends and fluctuations are usually dependent upon a company's earnings and operations. These can be measured by P-E ratios or price to earning ratios, as well as a variety of other complex metrics. Next, we need to understand how and why share prices fluctuate. The stock market is composed of millions of investors and individual traders who all feel different ways about a company. They all make independent choices and the net of those choices result in the positive or negative movement of a stock. If more people buy, then the price has to climb. If everyone wants out of a company, then the price falls due to lack of purchasing demand. If there are more buyers, then the price will go up. If there are more sellers, the price will go down. The basic concept of insurance is that a company, the insurer, offers a guarantee for a certain risk that may or may not occur. Then another party, the insured, pays the insurer in exchange for protection against that risk. When a bunch of people do the same thing for the same risk, eventually the insurer is getting a lot of income, but the probability of that risk happening is spread out among a bunch of people and stays about the same. Insurance companies make money by figuring out how much money they need to bring in to turn a profit on a given risk with a given probability. 
That calculation then influences how much each of the insured pays each month. In general, it's simple math, but in actuality, insurance companies have highly complex models for all of this. Not every insurance company offers the same insurance. Most insurance companies will specialize in their own kind of insurance. This is because each company has to develop a complex model to ensure that they can make money insuring a profit. You might be wondering though, why wouldn't you just want to save your money each month, get to hold on to it in a bank account, then if nothing bad ever happens, you have a lot more money. Well, while that may be true, it makes you the one exposed to the risk. When an insurance company wants to buy insurance on their own insurance policies, well then they buy something called re-insurance. That is not a joke. Say an insurance company realizes that they're overexposed to home fire insurance and a hot summer is coming up. Well, they could take out reinsurance policies on their insurance policies to protect them from high losses in case all their houses they insure just burst into flames because global warming and whatnot. Then all the risk is all on the reinsurance agency. This is a necessary thing, too. Think if an insurance company insured everyone in Florida's cars, but then a hurricane came through and destroyed all the cars. Well, that insurance company may owe more in payouts than they have, and once they run out of money, well, then no one would get money for their destroyed car like they thought they would. Reinsurance is necessary and important to ensure that insurance companies remain profitable and solvent to pay insured when there are claims. In terms of claims, insurance companies also don't just automatically pay out if you have car insurance and you show them a crashed car. The insurance company will investigate to make sure that you didn't intentionally crash your car to get the payout. If they find out that you did do that, well that's called fraud and you can go to jail. Faking insurance claims actually does happen quite frequently. People see it as a way to either get a big cash windfall if they're in hard times or get out of a car or house payment that they can't afford. If you've been paying attention to the news recently, you might have heard a little word called inflation. Inflation is essentially the devaluing of a currency. While many people have a connotation that inflation is very bad, inflation on its own is actually a necessary part of a functioning economy. Inflation is the reason things seem to get more expensive over time, both because goods get more expensive and a dollar goes less far to purchase things. Generally, inflation is expected as a percentage decline in value, and generally the Federal Reserve in the US targets inflation to be at roughly 2% per year, but a variety of factors cause inflation to swing up and down. Defined simply, inflation is the rate at which a value of a currency falls and the price of goods rises. People that own goods or assets generally like inflation because these goods go up in value with inflation, but people holding cash don't like inflation because it decreases the cash's value. Inflation is caused primarily by an increase in the supply of money. If a good has one value with one total supply of money, in order for the ratio of value to total supply of money to stay the same, or how generally expensive or cheap something is when the overall supply of money goes up, so too does the value of that good. Some inflation is caused by a demand pull effect, or an increase in demand for goods, usually from more money, without an increase in supply of those goods. When there's more demand, but the same or decreasing supply, the price has to go up. There's also built-in inflation, which occurs when a population expects inflation, which they then demand more pay for the same work, resulting in people having more money, resulting in the price of goods going up, resulting in more inflation. This final type of inflation can spiral out of control without a centralized approach on how to handle it. 
Inflation is often viewed as good because it promotes investment. When you expect your money to be less valuable in the future, you get out and spend it now on investments that will grow to counteract the value decrease. However, inflation does generally hurt people without assets and low amounts of cash to invest. If these groups of people don't see wage increases, then over time, the same salary numerically actually becomes worth less and less. This is why countries raise minimum wages and why companies will often process annual raises. The last thing to realize about inflation is that it can generally be controlled by adjusting financial levers at the central banks of a country. By adjusting interest rates, the central bank can temper or accelerate interest in investment. By association, influencing inflation. Inflation can get out of control, though, when consumer sentiment and outside factors fly off the handle. In these situations, we see hyperinflation, where a currency is rapidly devalued and economies can collapse if this occurs. But, for the most part, inflation is a carefully controlled metric and to be expected in modern economies.